All right, what's up guys? I hope you're doing well. James here from jamesdforsight.com. So I wanted to go on a little bit about the actual glass committee itself. And so, and also Warburg's retaliation to what happened there. And so basically in early January, 1913, the glass committee began its hearings and together with Mr. A. Barton Hempburn, Mr. Victor Morovitz, and some of Warburg's associates at the Citizens League, he was invited to basically go to it and give presentations and that sort of thing. Um, he appeared before it, as he says explicitly, right? And again, as always, our, with these specific videos or types of videos, abuse Warburg's writings him, or it, themselves. And so this one specifically comes from the Federal Reserve System, its origin and growth, published in 1930. Basically, his reflections on the Federal Reserve and how that played a part of his life and all that jazz. But regardless, going back on to more of the Glass Committee itself. So basically, at the hearings before the Glass Committee, someone by the name of Mr. John V. Farewell, or Farwell, uh, the president of the National Citizens League, and then Professor J. Lawrence Laughlin, its chief exec executive, both offered regional plans. Again, like we said in the previous video, regional plans are much more common at this time, um, especially coming, they became particularly common in 1912, um, and the class committee actually happened in January 1913, like I said earlier. And so, with respect to the plans, so Mr. Farwell proposed in general terms a regional plan with five, or quoting, five or at the most seven district associations with a central cooperation board, right? And then Professor Laughlin, um, who'd been apparently um, anxious to submit a substitute to the Alders Plan in general, um, presented a bill basically to as full a detail as you could. Right. He just went all out in that respect. And so basically after this House Committee, right, the Glass Committee, it was a House Committee of hearings. And so it had established the fact that no scheme would be considered seriously by Mr. Glass and his colleagues unless it embraced the Regional Reserve Principle. And so basically this is where Warburg goes to town of what he, he needs to do. And so he at once revised his plan which he outlined to Mr. Morgenthau a month earlier, um, suggesting that instead of having a central, a single central institution, the United States be divided into four zones with a bank in each. So basically, Warburg created his own um, regional reserve plan, taking off of some of his previous plans, um, specifically, as we just said, from what Mr. Morgenthau and what he presented to him in 1912. And so, and I did a specific video on that in general, um, and that was a few ago, and I'll try to put it as a card or something up in the corner um, around this time. So, make a note to the time. But regardless, so these four regional reserve banks were to be mutually responsible for each other, and their profits and losses were to be pooled in, pro pro in proportion to the capital they represented, right? So again, basically... Each region um, would basically share in the profits and losses of the system as a whole, and basically, and that would all be proportional to how much capital they actually represented in the system itself. And so, going into more specifics of Warburg's kind of new plan is he'd have an issuing department at Washington, which would be responsible, which would be responsible for issuing the notes. And this, these notes would be under the joint responsibility of the four regional reserve banks to actually fulfill those obligations. And then also he established a board of regents at Washington, right? So this is kind of the beginnings of, or I guess a more explicit beginning specifically from Warburg of the board of governors, right? And he says, this is to consist of, go of the governors of the four regional reserve banks four in number. So I'm assuming he says governors here, but it seems like this is going to be more of like the Fed Bank presidents specifically, um, possibly. Um, again, I've noticed going through here, he kind of uses governors. Warburg uses the word governors basically universally throughout the text, 
but whenever we get into a juxtaposition of the Aldrich Bill and the Federal Reserve Act, uh, Glass and Owens use presidents sometimes in that respect. And so sometimes it's difficult to tell when they're talking about the same kind of person when one uses governors and one uses governors and presidents um, in terms of just kind of distinguishing which part of the systems. But regardless, so basically the governor of each of these four each of these four regional reserve banks is going to be a part of this board of regents, the secretary of the treasury, uh, the governor and vice governor of the issuing department in Washington. And then he says, and four members, one from each region, not being bank or trust company officers to be appointed by the president of the United States. So he is implementing that kind of more um, public control in there to where it's not just kind of the banking system itself controlling the banking system. He's also putting gov um, president appointees in there as well. And so he says the board of regents was to be supervisory and, is, sorry, the board of regents is to have supervisory and veto powers over the regional banks. So it is to publish twice a month the condensed statement of the four regional reserve banks it was from time to time to fix discount rates and to establish a general policy concerning the investment or sale of foreign exchange and the purchase or sale of U.S. government bonds and treasury notes. All right, so kind of going more into what that Board of Regents, what will become the Board of Governors um, and what they are allowed to do. Basically have both supervisory and veto powers over the regional reserve banks, but I'd like to point out that it seems like it's tech specifically veto powers at this point in time. So basically the regional reserve banks would still have um, independence in their operations to a certain degree. Obviously um, that would be limited to, that would be limited by the veto powers from this board of regents. And so to continue, uh, he says a system of fee of free transfers of balances from one branch to the other was to be worked out regulating exchanges between cities. Um, so this is going to look a lot like the basically settlement with bank reserves that we see now between banks for in, within the different regions. Right. And essentially he sent this whole memorandum as he calls it for his revised plan. He sent it back to Mr. Morgenthau on January 10th of 1913 and then sent copies to Colonel House and Dr. Willis. Um, I highlighted Colonel House again because I did, I think I did a whole video on basically kind of the more, how he's kind of seen sometimes, or I've seen him portrayed as kind of the puppet master of the Wilson administration. And to what degree that's actually true, I'm not sure. I haven't looked into that explicitly. I just know that's the thing, so I pointed out. Anyways, so... Keeping in mind, especially with Dr. Willis um, in this respect, so he basically says, and as much as all these plans were submitted fully three months before the Willis Digest of the first draft of the Federal Reserve Bill was written, it is very difficult to understand why. Do it, it is very difficult to understand exactly what Dr. Willis had in mind when, in his book, The Federal Reserve System. Uh, he wrote that the Federal Reserve Act, quoting, was not derived from or modeled after or influenced even in the most remote way by other bills or proposals currently put forward from private sources, but on the contrary, it, it was itself the pattern from which a host of imitators sought copy. So basically, it seems like Dr. Willis is taking full credit for the Federal Reserve Act, basically saying, again, not derived from, modeled after, or influenced even in the most remote way by other bills and such, or plans, or like the Aldrich Plan, um, or Warburg's advice in general. And this might be why Warburg actually wrote this book with a giant section that's a juxtaposition of texts. So as literally between the Federal Reserve Act, you know that Dr. Willis is saying it's not modeled after literally anything. Um, and the Aldrich Bill, basic, and, and he literally goes through section by section and highlights which points are sometimes fair batum the same in bold with the same exact things like it. Uh, so maybe this entire book is just kind of a... Uh, 
little petty match between the two. But I guess we'll find out with kind of a little bit more study and looking at other things. But anyways, I thought this was pretty interesting, so I thought I'd share it with you guys. And I'm going to leave this one here. So I hope you guys have a good night, and I'll see you on the next one.